All right. Like I said, we are continuing this sermon series on spiritual on spiritual disciplines. Uh, we have walked through several spiritual disciplines together. We started with Bible study, prayer, and solitude. Uh, service uh, was last week, and and this week is is confession. Um, one thing that is that is interesting is on days when we have uh, first communion and, and and those sorts of things, and, and days when family are in town. Uh, I would usually be nervous about preaching a sermon on confession, and the reason is uh, sin is a weird thing to talk about. Uh, and so I, through my upbringing or my own uh, church past, for various reasons, I have this angst around the idea of sin, around uh, which is probably warranted, and then I have this angst around the idea of, of confession about, uh, uh, in my mind, confession always felt like groveling, sort of. And I don't like that because I'm kind of a uh, headstrong person. And so that always uh, left me feeling weird about if God uh, loves me, then why do I constantly need to grovel? And so uh, what I will say is uh, hopefully through this uh, sermon will realize that what's happening in confession and absolution is not groveling. In fact, it's, 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 it's quite the opposite. And so confession, here's a definition of confession uh, that uh, I made up, so if, if it's not good, blame me. But it, I say uh, that confession is the act of reminding myself that I am not God, even though I think I am. So it's the act of reminding myself that I am not God, even though I think I am. And that's sort of the first step for me um, when I start to view confession as groveling, is recognizing that, well, I feel like I'm groveling because I feel like I shouldn't be held accountable to anyone or anything, maybe. <laughs> but then I have to remind myself that, that I am not, that I'm not God, even though I think I am. And uh, you should all be very thankful that I'm not God, that's for sure. <laughs> so, so that's our, our definition of confession. And so we're going to talk uh, this morning real quick about two types of confession. Plus, we'll touch on, on absolution. Because that is a, an, an integral part of what we just did a moment ago together. And what the spiritual discipline of confession uh, does for our lives. Uh, we've been talking about how we have uh, New Year's resolutions, and this is the time of New Year's resolutions to uh, build up our, our bodies. We eat right, we exercise, we read more, those sorts of, all those resolutions. Um, but these are spiritual resolutions, and these are ways that we can exercise the relationship that we have with God, uh, not so that we are can be better than everyone else around us. But it's a way of leaning into that relationship. It's a way of recognizing that it's okay to acknowledge that you have a Father in heaven and it's okay uh, to lay down your burdens. And so uh, we're talking about confession in, uh, this morning and we will talk about the first type of confession uh, in a moment. So a confession, the word confession, basically means a statement of truth and so when we're talking about confession here in the church, usually we think of the second one. We think of the uh, what you have done. We're confessing our sins. Uh, we're, can, we're, uh, we're talking about all the, the bad stuff we did so that we can receive absolution. And so uh, that is a statement of truth. It is a statement of, of what we have done. There's also another type of confession that we'll talk about first, and that's that middle line there, a statement of truth about what you believe. Here every week, if you're here with us, I invite us all together to confess our faith. And so this is the first type of confession that we will talk about. This is a confession of, of what you believe. And being that this is a First Communion Sunday, I thought it would be no better time than to break out Luther's small catechism. If you've never read through this thing, some of you are like, oh my gosh, I've got it memorized. <laughs> PTSD, and, and some, yeah, 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 exactly. Some people are in a panic, they're sweating right now. Some people are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so we're, gonna, we're going to uh, talk a little, uh, little bit about uh, what, how Martin Luther would have taught this, 
this confession of faith and then a little bit about what that means for us uh, today, almost, almost 600, year, 600 years later, 500 years for sure. Um, so a confession of faith is, is uh, we're talking about uh, what you believe, and more specifically, we're going to talk about a confession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. In the Apostles' Creed, it can be broken up into kind of three, three main sections. We have creation, we have redemption, and we have sanctification. So the first article, as Martin Luther would call it, of the Apostles' Creed is, is creation. And that's the part, if you know the Apostles' Creed, it, go, it starts with, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, uh, maker of heaven and earth, creator of heaven and earth, whichever way that you may have learned it. And so if I read here from the words of, of Martin Luther, Martin Luther would uh, explain it like this. Martin Luther says, what does this mean? Question mark. And this, what this means is, I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and my soul, my eyes, my ears, and all of my members, my body parts, my reason, and all of my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing, even though it has cat hair on it. He gives me clothing and shoes and food and drink, house and home, uh, friends, children, family, land, animals, and all that I have come from uh, my Father in heaven. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and this life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all spiritual evil. All this he does only uh, out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness uh, on my part. For all, uh, for all this, it is my duty then. It's my responsibility to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. So in a moment here, we'll have a, an opportunity to do this together where we will confess the Apostles' Creed. And when we say these words, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, we are confessing, uh, therefore, to all these things uh, that, that Martin Luther uh, says here. And all the things that, that we know to be true but sometimes forget. Uh, and all those things that uh, spiritual disciplines, these intentional acts of, of prayer and solitude and Bible study, all these things help us uh, to remember that we have a Father in heaven and that I uh, am not God and that uh, everything around me, all the blessings in my life are uh, gifts, gifts from God. And so I have to remember that, that, uh, that I owe, uh, at the very least, gratitude uh, to God. But what God is looking for is, is uh, relationship. And so we have this, our Father in heaven, we have this sort of parental uh, type relationship with our Father in heaven. And that's one of the first things uh, that we confess when we confess uh, our faith and we confess what we believe. I suppose right now I should say that we will say these words together and you may be someone who doesn't believe these things. And what I would offer to you, and I will offer again when it's time, is try it on for size. Uh, tr try this on. See if when you say these words, uh, the God doesn't speak to you. It's, a, it's an offer, and, and we won't tell anyone. All right, so this is the second, <laughs> the second article here, the second portion of, of the creed, the Apostles' Creed. We start with creation. And then we move here on to redemption. This is the part that says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, uh, power of the Holy Spirit, so on and so forth. We'll do that here in a moment. And so Martin Luther would explain it this way. What does this mean? Martin Luther says. And then Martin Luther answers himself. And he says, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also a fully man, born of the Virgin Mary, uh, is my Lord. Uh, who has redeemed me, a lost person, purchased and won me from all sin and death and from the power of all evil, not with silver or gold, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own 
and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting love for all of eternity. We start with, with the creation and we move here to redemption. We, moved to, we move here to uh, confessing that we understand that's because of what Jesus did and not what we do, that we are able to have this eternal life, that we are able to uh, count on this promise, that we are able to trust in God when he says, I offer this to you. And it's because of what Jesus has done, that act of redemption that he has done on our behalf, uh, that we are able to have access uh, to eternal life. So that's creation. That's redemption. The last one, as we see, is sanctification. And this is the part that uh, in the Apostles' Creed that says, I believe in the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, and so on and so forth. We'll do this together in a moment. <laughs> what does this mean, Martin Luther says? And Martin Luther answers himself yet again and says, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified, and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole church on earth and keeps it with Jesus in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all who ask for forgiveness. On the last day, he will raise me and everyone and give eternal life to me and all believers. This is most certainly true. What we believe here is we have a God who created the universe and everything in it. Of what we confess, profess to believe is that things aren't always right here on earth. And I play a part in that. I play a part in making earth a not as it would be in heaven. But because I continually play this part on making earth not as it would be in heaven, God has found a way to make things right. And that's the redemption. God has sent his son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And then lastly, it's the Holy Spirit that's in our lives uh, that uh, empowers us, uh, first of all, to uh, hear and receive. Uh, the, Martin Luther says the gospel here, but really it's the good news that God has made a way where there is no way, that God has offered uh, something beautiful and eternal to us. And all we have to do is say yes, I will accept this beautiful and eternal thing that you gave me. I will accept uh, this gift of the Holy Spirit in my life. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit then that we exercise these spiritual disciplines uh, by Bible study and by prayer and by solitude. We are strengthening that relationship on our side. We're understanding more and more our reliance on God for all things, even though sometimes I feel like I am God and don't need him. Uh, this act of spiritual discipline helps remind me that I am not God and helps remind me how much I, I, I do need him. So this is the confession of faith. This is the first type of confession that we'll talk about. And we can't have the second type of confession in, until we have this one. This is the, the one we start with. Because once we understand exactly what, who God is and what God has, has done for us and what God desires for us in that relationship, then we move on to this intimate act here of confession of sins. This is the what have you done portion of, of confession. This is the what have I done portion of, of confession. This is what, probably when we saw confession on the list of spiritual disciplines, this is the one we were, we were thinking of. Um, you can all uh, be calm now. I'm putting away the small catechism, so if you're... <laughs> there will be no quiz, I promise. <laughs> uh, but this is the part that, that most of us have in mind, and this is the part that, that honestly continues to give me the most anxiety for the reasons that I spoke about about earlier. 
But this confession, this confession of sins, has, has two parts uh, in it as well. The first is confession. Uh, and so we uh, know that. That's not uh, that mysterious. It's basically just saying, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, we speak every week here in our moment of, of confession and forgiveness or confession and absolution. Uh, and we confess those things that have damaged uh, the relationship between uh, God and ourselves and the and damaged relationship between uh, ourselves and others. Uh, that might not be the, the best way to put it because as I'm saying it now, I realize that that, that relationship uh, between myself and others can s- certainly be damaged. Um, we can offend people, we can hurt people, and those relationships take time uh, to heal for, uh, for trust uh, to be rebuilt. That doesn't mean that they can't be rebuilt, that they can't be healed. But those relationships are, are more difficult. What we're talking here specifically about the spiritual discipline of confession, however, is not this me to you confession. I'm sorry I did this to you. Do you forgive me? Let's, what we're talking about is this confession because these are spiritual disciplines where we're strengthening, strengthening our relationship with our Father in heaven. So this confession is the confession uh, to our Father. And heaven isn't necessarily up there, but we tend to look up there for heaven, I suppose. But but we confess uh, to God. We say, I'm sorry. And we confess those things that we know have damaged relationships to others, but this is a moment that we have uh, with with God our Father where we say, I'm sorry for the things that I have done uh, that have damaged uh, these relationships. Uh, I'm saying relationships a a lot this morning, I realize, and that's because that's the most important thing that God is after. That's why this whole thing has been started. God certainly doesn't need us, but God desires a relationship with us. And so we have an opportunity here uh, to confess those things that have have damaged the relationship on our end. The relationship uh, from God's perspective to us uh, is always there. That opportunity to, to fall into the arms of your father is always there. There is nothing that we can do where God will say, all right, I've had enough of you. I'm stepping back. You had your chance. Right? God is, is always there. So this confession that we have is really us repairing our side of this relationship It's recognizing that God is still holding his hand out to us. And all we have to do is is reach out for it. And that's what we do here in confession. Is we let go of those things that are taking our time and our attention. And we reach once more uh, to the hand of our Father in heaven. And this is a, you know, for for many of us, for myself, it's a minute-by-minute exercise almost depending on what's going on in our life. It's a constant, oh yeah, I'm still holding this. Let me reach up. Oh yeah, I've lost sight. It's always happening. And so that's the first part of confession. The second part of this confession of sins is is absolution. And absolution is a recognition that I am forgiven. Talking about God is weird because uh, God is sort of outside of Space and time, God's forgiveness is always there, like I said. But the second part of confession, hearing the words of absolution here on a Sunday morning or from a friend, um, hearing these words, I am then recognizing that I am forgiven, are an integral part of this. It's not enough just to say that I'm sorry, uh, because God wants to offer us more. God wants to offer us uh, that repaired relationship, and that's what happens in absolution. It's a recognition on our part that he try as we might to destroy that relationship. It has, has not been destroyed. It's still there. It's always there. It will always be there if we're willing to take part in it. That's the confession of sins, and that's the, what always felt to me uh, again, like, like a groveling, like I need to go uh, sit with uh, the priest or whatever and, and confess. 
and then only uh, if, if I did all the right things, then I would be, then I would be forgiven. But what's really happening here is us putting our trust in God, us saying, I trust you. I've confessed all these things I believe, and now I'm going to live that out. I'm going to uh, take you at your word, Lord, uh, that you love me and that you forgive me, and I'm going to live in that love and forgiveness. That's what happens here. In confession, it's a, it's a gift that we have. God says, uh, Lay down your burdens, as we heard in the song. Lay them down. I'm giving you a gift. I'm giving you an opportunity to live a life that is not weighed by this garbage that you carry everywhere with you. This is a, a gift. And, and you may say to yourself, well, then why do I have to confess? Can't, doesn't God just forgive me? Yes, uh, God forgives you. The confession is for you, not for God. The confession is for you to say, I recognize first that that's what's happening here, and then, and then it's an opportunity for you to say, now I lay this down. This is where you get to uh, un- be unburdened. We understand that we are loved and, and, and forgiven and, and have this eternal relationship, but this confession portion is the gift to you that God gives in the same way when we celebrate the Lord's Supper and we eat and drink the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Jesus, that this is a, a physical gift where the forgiveness of sins is made real and physical to us. This is the same thing. This confession is a gift. It's something that's offered to us, something we should look forward to. It's a spiritual discipline that we should uh, take part in daily. And so through this uh, sermon series, I've been trying to give tangible ways to practice and exercise these spiritual disciplines. And so we're going to uh, talk about that real quick right now. If we go to that next slide real quick. So private confession. Uh, There are Two ways, but really one way, that we can practice a spiritual discipline of confession. There are many ways we're going to talk about. First, we're going to talk about a way to daily practice a spiritual discipline of confession. And that, that looks like this. Morning and evening prayers. Oh, I'm going to break it out again. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> But Martin Luther had, and the small catechism teaches us uh, an, a way of having morning and evening prayers. It's, they're even written in there for you, if that's the sort of thing uh, that you would like to have words supplied. But it's, it's and in the morning and evening prayers, we uh, pray to our Lord. Uh, Martin Luther suggests praying the Lord's Prayer, and then Martin Luther also suggests praying the creeds. Twice a day, morning and evening, confessing what we believe to be true, uh, what this does for us daily, twice daily, I suppose, and you can do it more than twice, you won't get in trouble, is you can do this uh, as often as you would like us to confess what you know to be true. Because as soon as you walk outside these doors, uh, things look and feel and smell and sound different. You won't hear all of the time about God's love necessarily. You won't hear all the time about how you are forgiven. You won't hear all of the time about how God has created everything, the universe and everything in it, and you, and loves you and wants a relationship with you. So this discipline of confessing what we believe to be true is our way of carrying this with us, this truth, uh, throughout the day. It's a way of recognizing that, yes, uh, even though I'm out here in the cold and brutal world, that, that, that God loves me. And I remind myself of God's love every time that I confess my faith throughout the day. That's morning and evening prayers. That's confessing your faith daily, and that just means we're going to pray. That's one of our spiritual disciplines. And then it's, we're going to confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed, for instance. If you don't have it memorized, you can Google it. It's everywhere. But, yeah, but that's daily confessing what we believe. The second one is, uh, is uh, privately. And if we go to the next slide, what this one means is that uh, privately, we confess privately to your pastor. And here, this is, this is again where things get uh, 
if I were in your shoes, if I was looking up here, uh, I would think to myself, well, who does this guy think he is that I need to confess to him? And, and I agree with you that that's exactly what you should be thinking. <laughs> but there's uh, what happens here in, in the church is when uh, you all extend a call uh, to a pastor and, and in, in this situation in particular, it was me, so thank you. And so you extend the call to the pastor. And then there's an ordination ceremony where there's maybe a laying on of hands. Some of you all physically touched me that day, so thank you for uh, being gentle. And then we, we prayed, and, and what happens, what we're doing there is we're entering into a covenant relationship with one another and with God. And we're saying, uh, God, we're... we're uh, putting our trust in this, in this person. And God is acknowledging that we have put our trust in each other. And so you know, all, the, all the seminary things and all those things that, that, a, that a pastor does before, uh, before uh, becoming a pastor are the training portion so that when the congregation comes and, and lays their hands on, on a person, and, and me in particular in this situation, uh, they know that they can trust this person because there's a relationship there. There's training there. There's a relationship and there's an understanding that we all want what's best for each other. And so uh, when we say confess privately uh, to your pastor, the office of the, of the keys, what this means is that God has, has uh, created this, the church that we're in and part of that authority of a pastor to, uh, to hear a confession comes from that mutual uh, agreement that we have made. It's not because I'm a, a special and, 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 and a holy person, that's for sure. Uh, what it is is that we have agreed that this is the relationship we're going to enter into together. And God offers this gift, one of my... Uh, duties as a pastor is is to be what's the word where you don't tell everybody everything confidential Confidential, thank you i've been talking too long i'm forgetting words confidentiality right we have this relationship all of us you and i individually together and sometimes there are things that no matter how many times we confess to the lord in prayer or maybe we confess to one another about the things that have damaged that relationship Sometimes there are things that weigh so heavy on us that we just can't let them go. And I'm not saying that this is going to be the thing necessarily, this private uh, confession with me as your pastor. I'm not saying that this is necessarily going to be the, the, uh, the final fix. But what I'm saying is that because we have offered, uh, 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 entered into this relationship together, then you can come to me. And you can hear, and that's the most important part of this, is in your time with the Lord, you don't necessarily always hear the words using your tympanic membrane, your eardrum. You, those, that doesn't move around. But when you hear words of forgiveness from a person, as if hearing them from God himself, then all of your senses are activated in this a time of absolution. And so this is another gift that God has offered uh, to all people in the church. There is, if any of you have, have confessed, done a sort of a private confession with your pastor or maybe with one another, then you know that there's just something different about unburdening to a person, that there is something real and tangible. It's a different experience. And so one of these spiritual disciplines that we have access to in confession is that you have a pastor, uh, and I would love nothing more than to sit with you in these moments and help you uh, be unburned, not by me, <laughs> uh, but by God. Together we will go and, and, and be unburdened. Those are two ways that we can practice the spiritual discipline of confession. So we started uh, uh, this uh, sermon here talking about confession being a statement of truth about what you believe and what you have done. And I'm going to alter that 
a little bit here right be, uh, before we leave. So last thing is, this is a statement of truth about who you are. This is confession. And uh, what I mean by this is, I'm going to make an analogy that just might make some people hate me for some reason, but I'm going to do it. So I, I fully acknowledge that in our day-to-day life, we like to do things to make our appearance and that sort of thing, and we do these things. And so uh, I, I have a friend who is uh, in her 50s, and she was talking to me about uh, she needs to go color her hair because some of the gray is coming out and that sort of thing. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, because she would complain about the cost. She couldn't find the time. I was like, well, why? Just let it. Why? Why do you have to do it? And she said, well, I don't want to look like a grandma. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you are a grandma, but whatever. <laughs> but, but, what, uh, what I recognized in that moment is that uh, most people her age have gray hair or all gray hair or that sort of thing, right? But there has been the silent contract made with everyone that uh, we're going to pretend that we're not. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to offend anyone. Uh, obviously, I, you know, I do my own stuff, so uh, color your hair, I don't care. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a whole analogy. And what I'm trying to get as is, is uh, we have decided, oh, I'm digging myself a hole. We have decided, <laughs> I'm coming out, I promise. I'm coming out right now. We have, we have decided that uh, because uh, we look around us and, and she doesn't see anyone uh, that looks like her, then she has to fit in with everyone else. And when I say that confession is a statement of truth about who you are, I'm not saying you have to confess that you color your hair. Again, I don't care. What I'm saying is that, that what we do is we hide ourselves. We hide our true selves. We, every one of us, feel that we have at least one thing in our lives that we could never let anyone know about. Because if I let anyone know about this one thing, then the whole uh, castle of cards uh, goes crumbling down. This one thing that I can never let anyone know about, therefore, defines me. And if we never... Uh, let that out, then we are surrounded by people. I promise, me and everyone in here have at least one thing. We think, oh my goodness, if they just knew this, uh, life for me would be over. They would never look at me in the same, but the reality is uh, that we all have it. We all have it, but we don't share it. And because we don't share it, it grows and grows and takes hold of us. And this isn't a moment where I'm saying necessarily that you have to uh, confess everything, right? I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an experience, and that takes a level of trust. But what I'm saying is recognize that we are all the same, that we all have these things in our lives that we can't uh, let go of, that we are afraid to let ever other people see because we know how much, we think we know how much we will be judged. But if you've ever had that experience of, of confessing to someone something uh, that you share that is shameful, then you understand the freedom that comes from that. Because in that moment you recognize, oh, no, I'm not the only one. And so a confession is a recognition of, of who you are. You're not the only one. I promise I promise you're not the only one. I promise each and every one of us, myself included, have this brokenness in us, have things in our past that we wish we could take back, have these things that we just can't let go of, and those are the things that God says, let me take that from you. Those are the things that in this act of confession, God says, I see you for who you are. I see that you have this thing that you could never let anyone know about. I see that you are tortured and weighed down by this one thing in particular. And God says, I love you. I see you for who you are and I love you. 
You don't have to change that thing in your past because I love that thing in your past. And God says, I will use that thing in your past to spread my love to other people around you. The things in your past will be a witness to everyone you meet because when you are free with what you have done and you're free with your life, then you open up to people. And people then can open up to you. And they're able to be unburdened because you are being unburdened. And God says, I want that for you because I know who you are and I love you. Amen? Amen. All right. Will you uh, pray with me, please? Let's pray. Oh, I'm out of breath. Uh, Lord God, uh, uh, we thank you for confession. We thank you that uh, you listen to us in prayer. Uh, that we can go to one another and confess, and that, uh, Lord, you give us pastors to uh, confess to when we need those also. So, Lord, all these spiritual disciplines are powered by your Spirit, so we ask uh, that uh, you help us lean on the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, help us more and more every day look more and more like you. Help us lay down these burdens. Help us recognize uh, that you see us, you know us, you see all of those things, and yet you still love us. Oh, Lord, we love you. We love your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray, and all God's people said, amen.